Okay, um, in an effort to keep everything to time this afternoon, I'll suggest that we get started. Um, so my name is Lindsay Hedden. I am an assistant professor in the Faculty of Health Sciences at SFU, um, and I'm the assistant scientific director at BC's Academic Health Science Network. Um, I want to start the session by respectfully acknowledging that my home, which is now the place where I work, um, is located within the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, um, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. So the session this afternoon is going to focus on the impact of COVID-19 um, on health services and health workforce. A couple of quick housekeeping announcements before we start, and if you've been participating throughout the day, you've probably heard all of these before, so please bear with me. Um, we're going to have six 10-minute presentations today with a little bit of time, hopefully, for questions at the end. Um, if you do have questions, please use the chat function on, on the side. Um, keep yourself muted at all times unless you are the one who is presenting. Uh, we have a hashtag for the conference. If you use Twitter, it's BC COVID Research. Um, please tweet the things that you find um, interesting. And lastly, this session is being recorded and it will be available on the BC AHSN uh, YouTube page uh, in a few days time. So I'd like to start the session by welcoming our first uh, speakers, um, and that's Allison Hoons and Chris Carlston. Um, Allison is a clinical professor and knowledge broker in the Department of Physical Therapy at UBC. Um, and Chris is a, pr a professor and division head of respiratory medicine at UBC. So Allison and Chris, over to you. Chris, would you like to start? Unmute. Thank you so much, Allison. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Just briefly before Allison starts the first uh, part of this brief presentation, um, I wanted to thank everyone, including the organizers. It's so far gone remarkably well, and and it's it's great for me, and I'm sure everyone else to hear all these fast moving developments. We want to talk, Allison and I, about the post COVID recovery clinics and a network that's grown from that. Um, and, and make very clear to start that this is on behalf of a incredible group of colleagues that formed so quickly and synergistically in a way we'll describe that was a real eye-opening experience for me and how to do these things in real time and form something really uh, powerful. So I'll let um, Allison start um, and I'll come back to you uh, shortly. Go ahead, Allison. Thank you, Dr. Carlston. I just want to uh, further elaborate on the uh, symphony of people, although uh, Chris and I are presenting, as he said, um, we've been most fortunate to have over 60 people as a part of this initiative, including patient partners, researchers, clinicians, decision makers, health authorities, the Ministry of Health, Michael Smith, universities, etc. So, um, we represent just a few of the many who have done the hard work in seeing this launch. So next slide, please. Uh, so where this came from, as you, um, as we heard uh, in the initial session this morning, that there was an imperative need to integrate clinical care uh, in the context of a learning health system. Uh, that this was a new patient population uh, that patients were learning at the same time as clinicians were learning at the same time as researchers were learning about this new entity. Um, and that there are clinical care models that are available to us in this COVID era, increasing opportunity for virtual interactions, capacities for efficiencies, and participation and shaping of something new together with patients. Next slide, please. So when, uh, when this initially started out, what you see represented in front of you was just a, um, a graphical representation of some of the sources of uh, data that existed. Uh, blue representing um, regional and provincial data sources, green representing clinical sources, yellow representing public health, and the salmon colored areas representing research. And it became quite clear when one looks at this array of different sources um, that uh, integration was imperative. Next slide, please. 
So what, why, was, why was there a need to develop integrated clinical care with research embedded in it within a learning health system? Well, primarily because there was a great clinical care that was needed for a, a multitude of possible effects on health that as we know, COVID could affect many organ systems. And it was important as we heard this morning to make care and research low burden. Uh, one of the speakers this morning spoke about that these patients were going to be approached for uh, psychological assessment, for um, lab data, for surveys, et cetera. So there was a need to integrate all of that. And then to ensure that the research and the clinical community needs were embedded within the same, um, same space and a need to learn about with and from patients in post-COVID, about post-COVID in real time. Next slide, please. So how we got here, uh, it was the foresight of three respiratory clinicians um, who uh, had the foresight to look at this, Dr. Uh, Chris Carlston, Dr. Chris Ryerson, and Dr. Um, uh, James, that looked at uh, the fact that um, respiratory clinics were seeing these patients post-discharge from hospital. And there was a recognized need for that coordinated interdisciplinary assessment and care that it couldn't just be from a respiratory perspective because of the multi-organ systems. Also at that time, Michael Smith and the Academic Health Science Network were uh, starting to look at the array of research proposals that were coming in across the research community. And at that time, there were about 200 research proposals that had been submitted. And given the number of multiple unknowns about uh, what the care was that was required for whom and where and when, uh, we needed to create a system that allowed for a learning health system approach. Next slide, please. Oops, one sec here. There we go. Oops, did I go two? Sorry, go ahead. And the what, what we were looking for was a one-stop shop, essentially where clinical care uh, could be uh, coordinated between respirologists, hematologists, um, infection control specialists, neurologists, psychiatrists, et cetera. Uh, and an ability to connect British Columbians who had had COVID-19 with specialists, family practitioners, and public health services within one environment so that these patients weren't being asked to go to uh, cardiology, then respirology, then hematology, et cetera. Next slide. So approximately 60 clinicians, researchers, and patients have been meeting virtually since March. 7.30 Monday mornings, 5 o'clock, 5.30 on Tuesday afternoons. Um, there have been a plethora of meetings over the time to help to develop together a standardized intake assessment that would cross all of those disciplines, an integration of medical, psychological, and social supports, rapid access to specialized expertise where it was needed, and access to virtual care when it was required. If the person's, if there wasn't uh, an ability to attend in person, um, could we establish access to virtual care for those individuals? And importantly, a centralized data collection platform that enabled rapid exchange of best care and access to rigorous research. Next slide, please. So what you see here in front of you is just a very simple representation of that um, complex integration of clinical research, uh, clin clinical and research systems within a learning health system. So within the BC community, there's people at risk and there's people who were COVID positive, whether they were hospitalized or non-hospitalized. And they needed access to primary care physician and possibly um, specialists. The interdisciplinary clinical care clinics or post-COVID recovery clinics would exist within each health authority. They've currently launched within Vancouver Coastal Health and within Providence Healthcare 
but there is the intent to uh, establish these clinics in each of the health authorities within the province. Within those healthcare clinics then, there would be research embedded that were responsible not only for clinical trials and interventional trials, clinical protocols, but also discovery biobanking. So that first uh, section on the left that you see represents the post-COVID recovery clinics. And the network represents the integration across the clinics in each health authority. Next slide, please. So what happens when a patient is referred to one of these clinics? Whether they're hospitalized or not hospitalized, if they've been hospitalized, they would be automatically through a discharge pathway registered into the post-COVID recovery clinic. If they were not hospitalized, they could be referred to the clinic. They'd then be triaged for integrated clinical care. And there would be a standardized assessment, virtual or in person. There would then be integrated care with a care plan with specialists as required and the primary care physician where needed with follow-up at six to 12 months. Next slide, please. And what would that standardized assessment look at? What would it entail? Well, thanks to a lot of devoted, talented, uh, passionate people, uh, including our patient partners, we were able to delineate what the key lab tests would be, what the key diagnostic imaging and functional tests would be, and then a baseline series of questionnaires that our patient partners were central in helping us to delineate what would be feasible without too much undue burden. Next slide, please. Thanks. Uh Allison, um, I can put myself in Lindsay's place and know that she's looking at the time, so I'll try to um, move quickly. Really, I want to uh, end with a few slides that just give a slight bit of granularity about what we could do with this, and I'm, I'm giving it from the respiratory perspective, as you can imagine, uh, because of my discipline, along with uh, my, my colleagues who uh, as, as noted, uh, initially had this vision that's now expanded far beyond us with the help of Adir 11 and Allison and, and many others. But from the respiratory perspective, we've now seen not 60 really, but 80 patients, but have reported um, in manuscripts on the, on the initial 60. And just to give you a sense of the power of coming together and documenting something that was previously unknown, we have shown uh, that there are, are not surprisingly comorbidities uh, but mostly patients that did not have comorbidities. And by moving quickly, as you can see in the process side of the slide, by being essentially comfortable with, uh, with, a, with a plane that we're building as we fly it, um, by working with people that are broad thinking and, and leaders amongst them that are, are low in ego, but high on can do and proactive, um, pacing ourselves and being willing to work through the process, we got, for example, to these findings that the majority of people actually had some finding of pulmonary function deficit or CT scan abnormality, in spite of, again, being uh, uh, most of whom had no comorbidities um, and also didn't even report dyspnea. So deficits that they weren't even aware that they had physiologically that is important because later in life, as uh, one's lung function wanes, these will become uh, likely more important. Some, some of these changes include scarring um, that's unlikely to uh, reverse. Um, and then, and finally, as, as far as data, uh, showing that not just lung function and lung-related abnormalities, but more, perhaps more importantly, broad quality of life indicators, uh, frailty, uh, mood, et cetera, sleep, Again, in, in individuals who, who largely did not have these, um, these deficits coming into uh, their COVID experience, and regardless of whether they actually had the, the min minority having uh, comorbidities as assessed by the Charleston Index, you can see that people were uh, almost equally affected regardless of that. 
So finally, we come to uh, the, the realization, not surprisingly, that there's probably more we don't know than, than, than we do, um, which is, is why Allison uh, emphasized the learning health systems that, that moves uh, nimbly in real time. Um, I actually had a patient today, I scrambled uh, from my COVID clinic uh, who has a dermatologic disorder, which I had to read about. So it was a perfect example, not an hour ago, of someone who really did uh, challenge me to work with this patient and look at the literature together in clinic to understand the dermatologic issues um, and get a quick referral just the way we planned it. Um, so it was a nice example uh, from just an hour ago. Uh, but all these questions that you see remain uh, uh, critical to answer. And the system that we've put together through the hard work uh, that Allison described is, I think, really well set up to move forward um, to answer these questions in time. So this is our vision. I'll just uh, leave this here for a minute. I know uh, we went over time, so I don't want to rob others uh, further. Um, but, but this, we hope, is an example not just for COVID, but beyond. Um, and it's certainly been an incredible experience for me um, and the, the many others that you uh, briefly heard about to doing something uh, that we, we think is special in terms of this integration. Uh, and thank you everyone uh, uh, for your attention and sorry for going over time. Thanks, Allison and Chris. That was a great presentation on what's going to be a really exciting uh, both project um, and adaptation of the, the learning health system model, and I'm so excited to see it going forward. Um, if we could have um, Emily Jews get ready to uh, put herself forward. Perfect. I see your slides coming up. So um, Emily is a trauma surgeon um, in, at Vancouver General Hospital um, and a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Surgery at UBC. So over to you. Hello, can everybody hear me? We can hear you. Amazing. Uh, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to uh, talk today. This is a really impressive panel and I'm really honored to be part of this uh, talk today. So I'm gonna talk mostly, actually only about surgical services and try to keep it under 10 minutes, even if it's a very uh, passionate topic of mine. So quick objectives really talk about the direct and indirect impacts of COVID-19 on surgical care. I know a little bit of our response uh, here in BC and at BGH and emphasize the importance of surgical leadership, which uh, could be a little bit sidelined uh, during this type of uh, event. So I just wanted to quickly uh, give you my story. Uh, as you all know, on March 11, 2020, uh, WHO declared uh, COVID-19 as a global pandemic. Well, three days later, I was supposed to be on the plane to South Sudan to work in this hospital on the picture there uh, to provide surgical training to um, MSF uh, clinical officers as part of a surgical training program. And of course that did not happen. And suddenly I found myself very sidelined from all these events and thinking that really I couldn't help and I didn't have really a role to play in that uh, response to the pandemic. And I was actually sitting at breakfast with one of my really good friend, Dr. Murad Hamid, uh, who's also a trauma surgeon at VGH, you can see him in the middle of the picture here, um, basically leading in trauma activation. And we were discussing how to really respond to this type of event. And as we talk, we realized that yes, we do have a role to play in terms of crisis management, in terms of leading teams in uh, difficult situations and really changing environments. And maybe this was our role to play in this pandemic, even if it was a very um, still unknown at that time. And we started thinking really how does this pandemic impact directly and indirectly surgical services. And when you think back about other um, infectious outbreaks, we think about SARS, we think about Ebola, uh, really healthcare workers and especially surgical workers tend to be most affected in terms of higher risk of transmission to them. They have uh, really direct exposure to patients, repeated exposure to patients and high risk exposure to patients. We think about, for example, aerosolizing, generating medical procedures. Uh, they also uh, are patient population, if they're infected with that virus um, and have surgery, can have much worse outcomes. And we've known that from COVID-19 as well. And finally, an indirect impact uh, that became really clear initially in the pandemic response was that resources would be directed towards COVID-related or pandemic-related services. And so we think about, for example, ventilators or ICU beds, which our patients sometimes require as well. 
And I just want to quickly talk about the picture on the right here. Uh, in 2014, Times declared the person of the year all the Ebola fighters. And this person there is actually a surgeon who worked and was the head of the hospital in Liberia and basically led the Ebola response at the hospital and managed to get the survival rate up to 45% at the end of the outbreak. Uh, so this person was a leader in his field despite being a surgeon and this disease not being a surgical disease. We know that despite all of this, a lot of patients will still require surgical care. Uh, just as a, just a number to throw out there, uh, if you look at the global burden disease, 23% of that global burden disease can actually be tackled by surgery. So a quarter of the global burden disease uh, is surgical. So patients will keep needing these types of intervention despite uh, being in a pandemic era. So how do we maintain the services and how do we do this safely? As I said earlier, the number one risk is the risk to healthcare workers. And we didn't know much about the virus at the beginning. So that was a very scary time. Uh, I think that's a really good slide to remember in terms of protecting ourselves. Uh, and if you look at the different levels of protection, engineering controls, administrative controls, and then lastly, PPE, which is your last defense against the virus. I'll give you a couple examples of things we did. So in terms of engineering controls, as you all know, uh, purely elective surgery is completely stopped in phase two of the uh, pandemic response. And that basically freed up 70% of our hospital beds at VGH, which is tremendous and which, which really reduced the exposure of patients to uh, potentially to the virus. In terms of administrative controls, we changed the way we worked. Uh, for example, for the residency program, uh, the general surgery residency program, all the residents were pulled out of distributed sites and redistributed to only essential services, which meant trauma and acute care surgery mostly. Most of them were actually um, sent home, uh, again, to uh, change the, the way we do the work and diminish exposure uh, to healthcare workers. A couple more things we did. So we started working with our radiology colleagues or emergency department colleagues, basically everyone to actually uh, build um, guidelines to protect uh, patients and staff. So this is just one example of the multiple iterations of a um, CPG that we uh, built to do early CT scans in patients with acute surgical diseases and try to increase our diagnostic sensitivity uh, for um, to look for this disease because initially the PCR turnaround time was pretty uh, long and so it was very difficult for us to figure out if those patients were high or low risk for COVID-19 when they initially presented. Another example of an engineering control would be like the redesign of our trauma bay. Our trauma bay usually has three beds. As you can see here, we changed it to two beds and used the middle part to create a bunker for a uh, clean equipment so that it wouldn't be contaminated and added doffing stations and made this entire area negative pressure. Uh, logistically, this was uh, thought to be very difficult, but actually happened over four to six hours in like less than a work day, which was absolutely phenomenal from the maintenance team. So there was a lot of things that happened really quickly. So when while we were working on all this uh, and trying to scramble, figuring out what the best guidelines would be for our patients and how to maintain essential surgical care, because we did not want to shut down that type of work, um, we were looking for international guidance in that regard. And it was really hard to find few professional organizations starting putting out surgical uh, guidelines, but uh, they were not always aligned. The WHO didn't mention anything about surgical care. So it was very difficult to figure out how to best do this work. Plus, we saw that the pandemic was ramping up in areas of low resource. For example, this is a picture of uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Early April, where you can see there's multiple outbreaks of COVID-19. So it's already starting in places where they probably don't have those resources to actually tackle the pandemic. So how do we spread this information and actually help surgical workers, surgical um, providers, healthcare systems to better respond to this type of event? And our answers was actually to put together an open access online course, which was launched on April 28th, geared towards all surgical providers everywhere in the world to give them hopefully tools to better respond to this event and maintain essential surgical services. This course was only made possible by uh, the leadership uh, of the UBC CPD team, led by Dr. Brennan, who uh, supported this course 100%. Uh, and was hosted on a platform of the UBC Extended Learning with all the key uh, players that you see here listed, which uh, were extremely passionate and worked countless hours to put up the content, design diagrams, upload videos. It, it was a phenomenal amount of work and really, I, I don't even know how it happened to be honest. We had multiple collaborators from different clinical settings. 
uh, pitching on the course, uh, giving content, uh, doing podcast interviews, and not only surgical providers, but a, as you can see, also microbiologists, hematologists, family physicians, nurses, uh, techs. The course was made to be modular interactive. Uh, it's still online, by the way, if any of you is interested in looking at it, it's not uh, only for surgeons, anybody can do it. So we made it as uh, five modules, uh, the first one being mostly about the uh, infectiousness of the virus and, and basic uh, virology for surgical providers. The second module looks a little bit uh, deeper into a framework of response for surgical systems. The third module is about protection, so PPE mostly. The fourth is about uh, just more specifically obstetrics, thoracics, different surgical specialties. And lastly, we looked at the global impact of the pandemic. Just an example of a diagram that was made again by this amazing team looking at the framework of response. And we basically used the same uh, cycle as a mass casualty response, so mitigation preparedness, response, and recovery to uh, give example of steps to be uh, taken by surgical systems uh, to respond to pandemics. Uh, again, a useful tool we thought uh, for uh, and adapt adapted to different settings. We also use uh, to illustrate the course multiple case studies from different settings, low and high resource, uh, hopefully to be able to uh, be replicated in, in different settings, like I said, uh, not only in North America, but in places where uh, they had different access to surgery and different resources. In terms of the response to the course, uh, we're very happy to see that more than 1800 people registered for the course in the past four months. Um, people are still registering. We're not actively maintaining the discussions because it's been a little bit difficult in terms of manpower. Uh, it's reached like a pretty global audience, uh, mostly North America, but also uh, 19 countries in Africa, for example, Asia and Australia. So a total of 103 countries uh, represented. And I just wanted to finish with uh, very few quotes uh, that really made me happy in terms of achieving our objective, which was giving tools uh, to uh, people around, all around the world to better uh, respond to this pandemic and surgical care. I'm not going to read them all, but for example, in the second one there, I invited one of my colleagues to attend a course where we're both determined to implement the necessary changes and empower to help maintain health services in a safe way for both uh, ourselves and our patients. Uh, or I will be able to plan a protocol for surgical processes in our institute. So I'm happy that this inspired leadership uh, and the surgical health workers. It's not that's not just surgeons. I'm just going to reiterate that because it's also like nursing techs. Uh, we had pathologists join the course. So it really uh, touched a lot of different disciplines and uh, and uh, specialties. So in conclusion, uh, I think it's really important to remember that surgical care is and will always be an essential healthcare service. Again, 23% of the global burden disease is surgical. So this needs to be maintained throughout a pandemic or an infectious outbreak. Uh, pandemics will affect surgical care in different ways, uh, but healthcare system, if they respond well, like I think we did in BC, and like we, we really had um, and maintained good access to surgical care for our patients without any exposure to our healthcare workers, um, then we can actually do this well and uh, maintain good outcomes for our patients. And I think surgical workers in general should be leaders in the response uh, and their healthcare system. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Um, I'd like to move along quickly to our next two speakers, um, and they are Amanda Slonwhite and uh, Louise Mayer. Amanda is a senior scientist and scientific lead uh, for the Provincial Overdose Cohort at the BC Centre for Disease Control, and Louise is the Director for Health Surveillance um, with First Nations Health Authority. Um, Amanda, I think you're still muted. Oh, there we go. I'm having a technical difficulty um, sharing my screen. Oh. In what way? In that it's not letting me. Oh. Um, <laughs> just hold on a sec. I've got a copy of your uh, the slides that you sent, so I can share if that would help. Um, yeah, if you could just give me a minute. Sure. That would be great. Okay. 
Okay. Can you see? Yes. Yes, you're yes. good to go. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Um, I do apologize. Louise is not with me today. Unfortunately, she was unable to make it due to um, uh, a family issue. Um, so I will be doing this um, by myself and I will be presenting some of her slides that she um, has agreed to allow me to present. So before I get started, just um, to start off, um, I would like to respectfully and gratefully acknowledge that I work and I live on the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I'm very grateful every day to be working with members of our community who are First Nations and have lived and living experience of overdose and substance use. I wanted to start off with some uh, baseline statistics on overdose in British Columbia and how it has changed since the pandemic has started. So in 2019, we did see some modest declines in overdose deaths in British Columbia. Um, however, since the beginning of the pandemic, um, we have seen quite a large increase in the number and the rates of overdose death um, across the province. And certainly this has been in the news. Um, May, June, July of 2020, um, over 170 people have died of overdose per month. Um, important to note that many of these people are male and they are under 50 years of age and they were certainly not towards the end of their, their lives. Um, these are rates that haven't been seen since the um, declaration of the public health emergency on overdose that was declared in April 2016. Um, and we have also seen this trend demonstrated in non-fatal overdoses as well. So this is a graph that's available on the BCCDC website and is part of the BCCDC and the Overdose Emergency Response Center um, indicator reports that we report on monthly. Um, so we have seen a large increase in the number and the rate of non-fatal overdose events in the province. Um, as you, as if you use ambulance data available through BC Emergency Health Services. Um, Rates aside, if you look at the pure numbers, they are quite staggering. So in July 2020, there were 2,706 calls for BC EHS services at overdose events. Um, most of these calls are, are for men who are between 19 and 39 years of age. And they do tend to be concentrated in our urban centers, um, in particular Vancouver, Victoria, and Surrey but I would like to underscore that this is something we are seeing across the province and not just in urban areas. So overdose has not affected all communities or populations equally. Um, overdose has had a disproportionate impact on First Nations across British Columbia. And this was true before the pandemic, but those health inequities have widened as a result of the pandemic. Um, so these are slides from the First Nations Health Authority. Um, and so as you can see from 2019 into 2020, um, the number of First Nations overdose deaths has doubled. Um, so there was a 93% increase in deaths from January to May 2020 compared to the same period in 2019. And likewise, um, we're also finding, or they're also finding that First Nations are disproportionately represented in overdose deaths. So in 2020, 16% of overdose deaths were among First Nations people in British Columbia, whereas in comparison, First Nations represent only 3.3% of the province's population. The pandemic has also increased the rate of overdose death among First Nations compared to other residents. Um, in January through December 2019, so last year, First Nations people died at 3.8 times the rate of other BC residents, so non-First Nations people. In 2020, that has increased to 5.6, so First Nations people died at 5.6 times the rate of other BC residents, so quite an increase. So I thought it would be important today to talk about why this is happening. So why are overdose events increasing across BC? And there are three main reasons. Um, the first being the toxicity of the illicit drug supply. 
Um, more people are using drugs alone, and we have seen a reduced utilization of overdose prevention, supervised cons consumption, and healthcare services. So the first reason is that um, we have seen that the illicit drug supply is becoming increasingly toxic. And I think um, many people don't um, conceptualize that overdose is directly linked to the illicit drug supply in BC, but it is. So when we see the illicit drug supply becoming more toxic, we tend to see more overdose events. And we know this because of studies we have done at the BC CDC using data from the provincial overdose cohort. And we had a paper come out in CMAJ last week um, that looked at overdose deaths as captured in BC coroner service data from 2015 through 2017. And 93.4% of those overdose deaths had no prescription drugs detected in toxicology. So the vast, vast majority of overdose deaths in British Columbia are entirely attributed to illicit drugs, not those that are being prescribed or diverted. And prescription drugs only or prescription opioids only were found in 0.2% of fatal overdose cases. The second reason um, that we think we are seeing an increase in overdose across BC is because there has been a decline in visits to overdose prevention and supervised consumption sites across the province. And this is data that is available on the BC CDC website. So some sites in the province have seen a 40 percent plus reduction in visits. And so when people don't go to OPS or supervised consumption sites, they don't have the same access to harm reduction services. And there isn't necessarily somebody there to help them if they if they get into trouble, whether that's through the provision of naloxone or oxygen. And we do think that that is contributing perhaps to the the, the rise in overdose events across the province. And then finally, we also think that there has been this increase in overdose events because more people are using drugs alone. And I think if, if any of us um, consider how our daily lives have been affected by the pandemic, we many of us are spending a lot more time alone at home. And this is the result of physical distancing as well as um, other measures that have been introduced, some of the indirect consequences of those. We also know that um, there has been restrictions placed on visitors to single room occupancy hotels and um, public housing units and that people are more isolated from their, their community and their friends and family. And there's also the issue of stigma which persists in this province and throughout Canada towards people who use substances and people do feel more comfortable perhaps using them alone because of the stigma associated with their use. So in response to the dual public health emergencies of overdose and the pandemic, there have been new investments and new interventions and guidance issued by the province um, to assist in addressing um, the rise in overdose and also to assist people with isolation so that they don't um, go through withdrawal. And so we did receive some funding from CIHR and the Michael Smith Foundation, and an evaluation is ongoing of the risk mitigation guidance that was issued in March of this year um, by the province and the BCCSU. And this is a uh, collaborative project of investigators from the University of Victoria, UBC, and Simon Fraser. And we hope to be reporting later this year on some of those outcomes. So just to wrap this all up, um, I wanted everybody to leave with the key message that the illicit drug supply is the primary driver of overdose in British Columbia. So when we do see these changes to the illicit drug supply, we do see an effect on overdose cases. And unfortunately, the illicit drug supply right now is very contaminated and very toxic in British Columbia, which leads to more overdoses. Overdose was a public health emergency prior to this year. Um, if we think back in 2019, there was a lot of gains made, but we still had 984 people who died of overdose in BC. So um, this is a persistent public health challenge. And we do, 
believe that engagement of persons with lived and living experience of substance use and overdose in research and policy is critical to informing our research and the policy needed to address the overdose crisis. Thank you so much, Amanda. It's an incredibly important piece of work. Um, and thank you for uh, keeping your presentation to time. Uh, so uh, fourth in our line of great presenters, we have um, John Polovich, who is a clinician with Carrier Sakani Family Services. Um, I believe he is fantastic. Hi there, can everybody Hear me? We can hear and see your slides. All right. Hopefully. Welcome, everybody. Um, thanks very much for having me. My name is Dr. John Polovich. I'm a family physician. Uh, I've been practicing rural medicine uh, for over 25 years. And um, this is a story about um, virtual care in, in response to the COVID crisis. And, and really, um, I have nothing to disclose I also want to um, acknowledge the traditional territory that I'm speaking from in Abbotsford, the Stolo Nation. And my clinical work is uh, based out of uh, North, North Central BC. I'm the medical director for Carrier Scanning Family Services, which is based in Prince George. And I also lead uh, virtual health at the Rural Co Coordination Center of BC. And I direct the REAP program in BC, which is the Rural Education Action Plan. So, um, I want to, uh, I was asked to keep this short, so I will. Um, and this is a good short story, I think. Um, and I don't need to um, obviously convince anybody that that virtual health uh, and a virtual world um, w was uh, arrived upon back in March of this year. Um, the world was catapulted into it. Um, truthfully, uh, 10 years of work that I've been um, toiling at around virtual health was um, far surpassed in 10 days uh, back in March by the pandemic. And this is um, a little bit of data that came was published in the Canadian Medical Association back in June, just kind of highlighting the fact that uh, prior to COVID, um, there was very little adoption of, of virtual health post-COVID era or into the COVID era. Um, there was great adoption. And if people reflect back on, on March and early April, you know, the world was, was rather frozen in time. Um, people were very scared to go anywhere. We were uh, reading about watching uh, the news around things in, in Europe as well as uh, in China. And uh, it, it was a very daunting uh, time. There's a lot of anxiety. So I want to highlight that what I'm presenting to you today is is a product of, of multiple partnerships, and that's been a common theme that people have heard today. Um, the, this story is, uh, does not differ uh, from that theme. Uh, there are crucial partners in the, in this story. Um, Dr. Kendall Ho is a close colleague of mine who's who's on the the uh, on this call today. And uh, he's been a, a, a co-quarterback of many of the, of the pathways that I'm going to speak to over the next few minutes. And these are just uh, illustrations, uh, logos from the different organizations that have played a, a key role in this work. Um, and I think, again, a, a crucial part of this conversation is back in March, we found ourselves at an intersection moment of a lot of preparation and great opportunity. Uh, the opportunity being uh, a pandemic. The preparation dates back to um, over 10 years ago where virtual health has uh, slowly but surely iterated itself uh, and advanced itself through uh, solid evaluation and, and uh, research and community engagement um, and with a lot of stakeholders and building on the World Health Organization's uh, pentagram partnership model, including we, at the RCCBC, we've added a sixth partner being the linked sectors and really building um, these crucial linkages between all the partners um, over the last number of years led us to where we were able to quickly operationalize um, multiple virtual pathways to support rural BC. 
and this is, again, a story that is highlighted. Um, I want to emphasize this virtual support. Uh, the emphasis, uh, the focus is for rural, remote, and Indigenous communities in this province. So this is probably the most important slide that I'll show you. Um, and uh, it, it can be a little bit of a busy slide, but it's really where the rubber hits the road uh, about what we were able to accomplish in a number of weeks. The, uh, this all comes under the umbrella of real-time virtual support, which again is a, a critical partnership, the BC Emergency Medicine Network, the Rural Coordination of BC being, being uh, key contributors, the First Nations Health Authority, Providence Health, um, PHSA, all strong linkages, including the Ministry of Health. And under the real-time virtual support pathways, if you think about virtual pathways that are patient facing and those that are provider facing. So the patient facing uh, pathways um, were created to uh, address a, a great need. First of all, in the indigenous communities, um, back, in, back in March, uh, it was identified many, many indigenous communities, the ones that I, um, uh, for example, help work in and, and support care in, were locked down. They were cut off from, from the rest of the world, literally. And there are many Indigenous community members around the province, both rural and urban, found themselves unable to access care, either from uh, providers that they had a relationship with, but for many, they are unattached and they weren't even able to access um, community services and off-reserve clinics, for example. But on reserve clinics, um, many of them were, were closed during that time. Uh, in, a, in a similar way, the uh, Provincial Nurses 811 line, which I'm sure um, many, if not all of the attendees today are familiar with, was really being overwhelmed with, with calls. And uh, normally that, those call, daily call volumes prior to COVID being you know, in the a little over 1,000 to 1,500 calls a day, we're cresting over 7,000 calls per day. So uh, along with Dr. Ho and myself and others, we worked with other stakeholders to create a, a, a virtual physician group known as Heidi. And that group um, works in concert with the Nurses 811 as a triage system. And so the nurses can um, reroute um, patients that they feel they need assistance with to the virtual physicians. And this has been incredibly transformative for creating access uh, for patients to help deflect them away from uh, emergency rooms and keep them um, safe at home. It also uh, helps to expedite patients who um, would otherwise perhaps delay their presentation to healthcare facilities. And the uh, Heidi physicians could, could expedite uh, patients' um, arrival to emergency rooms or urgent primary care centers. The, so together, the Indigenous um, Virtual Doctor of the Day program and the Heidi program, really, those are patient-facing services. The other part I should add about the, the Virtual uh, Doctor of the Day program for, for the Indigenous communities is that it's, it's been regionalized so that there's a northern cohort, uh, an island cohort, a, a coastal Fraser cohort, an interior cohort and uh, of virtual physicians. That's been, I can elaborate on that more later. In terms of the um, provider fa facing support pathways, this is, was a crucial um, bit of work to support the most vulnerable communities and the most vulnerable providers. COVID comes with um, many uh, healthcare challenges that are that were anticipated to easily overwhelm the rural, uh, healthcare setting, the rural emergency department. People don't have negative pressure rooms. They don't have ventilators. They don't have sophisticated equipment. They don't have teams of respiratory therapists. Often find themselves with a single nurse and a single doctor. Uh, these are very, and then the remote nursing stations in indigenous communities are even further uh, lowly resourced. There are oftentimes one or two nurses there. Uh, there are no on the ground physicians. They're very modest amount of equipment uh, and uh, pharmaceuticals to rely on. Um, moreover, transport is often heavily delayed uh, it, from the time calls are made to move patients to the time help arrives can, can be many hours, if not days. So 
the the virtual uh, pathways of that are of note here um, involve critical care, and this is the Rosie pathway. Um, this group has, was around um, and was organized, and we learned a tremendous amount from this critical care group uh, of intensivists uh, that we were working with at the RCCBC. It, they um, they used to be called uh, their previous brand was was under the Cody umbrella, and now they're Rosie. Uh, in, in concert to the Rosie group, we created the Rural Generalist Emergency Medicine Group, known as RUDI. And this is a, uh, a cohort of virtual physicians that are um, from, from community, rural communities around the province, Golden and Cranbrook and Salmon Arm, uh, Prince George and Fort St. James and Powell River, Campbell River, but also some um, less rural, uh, larger community-based ER programs such as Kelowna and Nanaimo. Um, so together, Rudy and Rosie really um, provide a complement of emergency medicine and critical care support for any rural, remote, or indigenous community. Um, and this is founded on the Zoom platform for communication. It's a 24-7 um, service, so three in the morning, three in the afternoon. These, these clinicians here are um, fully ready to go. They're um, they're not working in their usual um, uh, departments, e either in ICUs or emergency rooms. They have dedicated time to take calls immediately, to be all in on calls, to do whatever it is that's needed to support those, those rural communities. Um, most recently, the, the two other programs have come on board, um, working with BC Children's Hospital and pedi pediatricians around the province. The Charlie Group has come on board to support uh, pediatric emergency medicine, pediatric ICU, mental health, and neonatology. That group came on July 1st, whereas Rudy and Rosie went live um, at the beginning of April. Uh, and lastly, the we have a rural maternity pathway now for rural maternity support, including newborn care. Uh, it's known as Mabel. Uh, it's not on this slide, but it, it, uh, it has just started uh, about two weeks ago and it really provides a complement of, um, again, provider facing supports for maternity, pediatrics, emergency medicine, and critical care. Um, then the less urgent uh, virtual pathways, I, I, I won't uh, spend time today talking about them, but we have a host that are uh, developing. UBC um, Dermatology has been a strong partner, uh, Rheumatology and others are, are for forthcoming. This is a quick slide to show you through the Zoom platform. The calls are coming from all over BC. It's very impressive. Uh, we have an IT team that, again, is a partnership between the Emergency Medicine Network, uh, First Nations Health, and the RCCBC, and, and many other organizations. Uh, Dr. Ho's team, along with Dr. Um, Helen novak Lauscher, lead out our evaluation strategy. So all this all these virtual pathways that I've alluded to have a very strong evaluation strategy wrapped around them so that we continually, um, we are a learning uh, organization as well and a learning entity. We really want to understand what's working so that we can uh, iterate on successes, uh, move away from, from things that aren't working well. These are just some of the highlights of the 90 day evaluation report that uh, is going to be formally coming out very soon. Uh, in addition to a probably a six month report, which will dig a little deeper on the data that's been collected this far. But these are pretty impressive numbers um, to date, uh, not just um, creating opportunity for peers to reach out for, for conversation and support, but also uh, understanding the cost savings to the, to the healthcare system in this province and starting to address the inequities that exist for rural remote uh, residents in this province. I will stop there. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, moving right along really quickly because we are rapidly running out of time, I'd like to move to our uh, penultimate speaker, Michael Schwant. He is a medical health officer from Vancouver Coastal Health and I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Hi there, it's Michael Schwant. So you got it pretty much perfectly. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I'll uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to talk today to this, the assembled participants about our response to COVID-19 in uh, long-term care in, in uh, BC, and I'll get right into it. 
our, um, the outline here is that I'll try to just give you a little bit of a background about long-term care and, and uh, COVID-19 in that context. Talk about some of the risk factors for why outbreaks of COVID-19 can happen in long-term care and why they can be just so challenging when, when they do. And finally, I'll discuss a few of the practices that we've developed and implemented uh, in trying to control those outbreaks in, uh, in Vancouver Coastal Health. So first of all, looking at the epidemiology of uh, COVID-19 in long-term care specifically, you'll see here that we've had a, had a number of cases during our first uh, first wave, if you will, and then, and then a smaller second wave, which is all due to one particular outbreak, the, the second wave. One thing I wanted to call your attention to here is that about half of the cases are indeed among staff. Most of the time it's a staff person who introduces uh, an outbreak to a facility in, in our experience. And it's often, I think, forgotten in the discussion of the, the residents, just how many staff are affected by COVID-19 uh, as well. So I wanted to uh, mention that. It's true that the uh, early on, the, the uh, incidence of COVID-19 in long-term care centers did mirror the incidence in the, in the general population. So, so during our, our first wave, we had COVID-19 in the community. And in turn, we saw that that appeared in the staff members and in turn in, uh, in some of our facilities within British Columbia. One thing I wanted to mention is the, uh, I think the uh, really good progress that we've had in spite of having a very large second wave that has affected many young adults, certainly in the age groups who might be working in long-term care centers, 20s, 30s, and 40s, we've actually had very little introduction of COVID-19 into the long-term care context in, in recent weeks. We have had over the course of this uh, pandemic, COVID-19 outbreaks in 15 of our 75 uh, Vancouver Coastal Health long-term care uh, homes. So of course that's one in five of them. Uh, and we've got a, one of the patterns that we've noticed is that these uh, outbreaks are either very small or they become quite large. There's a, a certain point, a certain tipping point that we've observed where if we're able to establish control early on, we can limit these uh, outbreaks to very few cases, most often one being the most common single number that we, that we see. Uh, however, when the outbreaks aren't detected early on or if control measures are a little slower to be established, we can often see some of the bigger outbreaks that you've seen probably widely reported. And I'm pleased to note that there's no uh, active outbreaks currently within Vancouver Coastal Health. Now, this is just an interesting variation on the uh, epidemiological curves for each of our long-term care outbreaks that we've had. So you'll see that these are arranged across an axis of time over the course of the pandemic. And the, uh, the dots there, or blobs, are representing the number of daily diagnoses among both staff and residents. So you'll see that the character of some of the earlier outbreaks was that a lot of cases were diagnosed very early on. And we think that this is actually due to limited detection in our earlier outbreaks and widespread transmission before the outbreak was actually uh, detected. More and more over time, we had these outbreaks where we detected a case very early on and were able to limit spread to uh, prevent transmission that became widespread throughout staff and residents. Uh, and you'll see that uh, in the, uh, this additional chart, that we have quite a broad range in terms of the attack rate among these long-term care facilities. So this is looking specifically at outbreaks where, staff, where residents were infected, uh, which is a smaller subset of the total outbreaks. And you'll see that while many of them remain small, the smallest, of course, being an attack rate of just 1%, uh, we had the largest of those was a, was a 48% attack rate and a whole range in between those. Wanted to note here that as well as having uh, outbreaks in a smaller proportion of our long-term care centers in Vancouver, Coastal Health, and NBC than some other provinces and other jurisdictions, we've also managed to uh, have better control, I think, in terms of the, those attack rates, where we saw sometimes attack rates of 50 or 75% plus uh, reported in some other provinces. We haven't uh, seen a, a outbreaks spread to quite that extent in BC. So how can these resident, how can these uh, outbreaks occur in long in COVID, in long-term care in the first place? Uh, one of the key things to keep in mind is the sheer amount of contact between staff and residents in long-term care. Uh, so this is a very particular context. Uh, it's not really comparable to to a hospital or to clinical medicine. That when there, when care does take place, it can happen very often that uh, residents might need help with activities of daily living, with medication administration, and with other medical care. And when those interactions take place, they can be quite close and for a long duration. Uh, there's really a high intensity of contact that occurs in this, uh, in this context. Unrecognized illness has almost become uh, the norm for this. I think unlike influenza-like illness where we have quite a bit of experience managing in long-term care, uh, we see a very heterogeneous presentation of COVID-19 in both staff and residents such that there can often be misses in terms of getting people into isolation, uh, taking uh, staff cases out of, out of work and, and limiting that risk. 
And then finally, there's this potential that we've, uh, that we've identified for very complex networks of contact and transmission, that many staff might work in multiple areas of a, of a center, rarely, in fact, uh, at the uh, onset of the pandemic, where people are restricted to a specific unit, uh, often in multiple centers or even in multiple health regions. So the uh, rapid networking of, uh, of infection between different centers and between different areas of centers was something that was very important to respond to. Now, when outbreaks do occur, how is it that they become so hard to control? One of the things, as I had uh, alluded to, is this really varied presentation of symptoms. And I think that a large uh, challenge in terms of recognizing those symptoms in an older adult population, often with, uh, with severe comorbidities in the long-term care context. So what were initially called atypical symptoms, things like uh, just increased fatigue uh, or confusion, actually turned out to be very commonly the symptoms that led to diagnoses of COVID-19 uh, in our outbreaks over time. These weren't always recognized quite as rapidly, and it was uh, with some retrospective work in our early outbreaks that we determined that some of these cases might have taken place before that they had actually been recognized by the, by the center staff, had testing, and gone into isolation. And during that time, we do know that there's a risk for a pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission that can be ongoing between staff and, and residents in a way that we don't normally see with influenza-like illness, where typically it is a reasonably severe illness that does declare itself. Uh, going right across the, this whole spectrum of test, trace, and isolate, uh, you do see the different challenges in long-term care. And coming to isolate, challenges of isolating resident cases and contacts are pretty extreme long-term care. As you'll understand, many of the patients might have cognitive impairments, dementia, uh, wander for a variety of reasons. So it's uh, very uh, staff intensive to isolate known cases and contacts within this context, which is something that we've heard from all of the long-term care centers that we've, uh, that we've worked with. And finally, isolating staff is also a concern. Uh, staff have very good reasons in terms of providing uh, both providing livelihood and feeling that they want to contribute to their teams uh, to uh, not to report symptoms, sometimes not going into isolation right away when it would have been appropriate, and making sure that, the, that they're well supported to do so is quite important. So just uh, moving into some of the interventions that we've developed, trying to finish on time and leave time for our colleague who's following. Uh, right across the sector, we established a single site staffing order, and this was to support uh, staff at long-term care centers and working at one and only one long-term care site rather than being at multiple different sites. So staff in this way would have more hours uh, in a single site rather than being in different places. Restrictions on uh, visitors was something that was established quite early on as well, and this has helped to limit the introduction of COVID-19 from community members other than staff. This is a balance that the province and the health region have worked to achieve, though, in terms of maintaining quality of life for residents as well. And then uh, having a great emergency operation center support that can get the material needs, uh, staffing and, and personal protective equipment to the centers when they need it. So we're not just ordering them to use it, but actually providing it in a timely way. Now I'll go on to just describe some of the key areas. One of, the, I think, the very most important things that I hope that people can leave with is an understanding of just how important proactive testing is in this context. The, again, the symptoms that older adults and the long-term care population may present with are just not always going to be the typical cough and fever that we might be watching for. And by watching for that only, we will fail to apprehend outbreaks at an early stage. So we often tell the staff that are working in these contexts that if, the, if a resident even looks at them differently, they ought to be tested and tested promptly. They ought to be isolated as well with proper contact and droplet precautions. Waiting to do that, waiting for more severe illness to declare itself will often lead to a mild case coming and going and meanwhile transmission potentially occurring. We also have to support staff uh, in being able to isolate themselves from work when they need to. So that means providing uh, staff with adequate sick time and adequate uh, staffing levels so that they're able to go off of work when they need to. Uh, we had staff that are deeply committed to working at the sites that they're, that they're contracted to and allowing them to work safely is very important. And staff, centers that were able to provide staff with uh, appropriate sick time were those that often had, were able to, uh, able to avoid ongoing transmission from staff. And then finally, as to the question of asymptomatic testing, which we're often asked about, we don't advocate for immediately testing in an outbreak every single resident or every single staff person in a long-term care center. And we don't advocate for doing that on an ongoing basis either. We think that it's a, a timing of that sort of screening is really important. So when an outbreak is growing quite rapidly, when there may have been a widespread exposure by a staff person, uh, and if we need to develop new microepidemiological information, as in what units of the long-term care home 
uh, has, has the infection spread to, these are the times that that kind of uh, asymptomatic testing might be valuable. In some cases, when we've deployed that, we've actually uncovered new cases uh, that we think have helped to uh, direct resources appropriately in the centers. I just wanted to say that before I wrap up that all of these uh, interventions are much easier to write in a guideline or to put in a presentation than they are to uh, implement in, uh, in real life in a long-term care center with stressed out uh, staff, residents, and families experiencing an outbreak. So our rapid response team was an absolute gem of a resource being on site at these uh, at all of the homes right away and providing uh, infection prevention and control support, helping to walk the homes through the all of the interventions that we're describing in detail. Many of these uh, of these homes thankfully don't regularly see outbreaks of influenza, let alone COVID-19, of course. So helping them out from a technical perspective uh, as well as materially is very important. So I'll wrap it there. I wanted to just say uh, thanks to my team for the opportunity to present uh, all of these findings. Thanks to the organizers of the conference. And of course, thank you to the, uh, the staff, residents, and families of the long-term care homes who have uh, learned from this experience along with us. Thanks so much, Michael. Great presentation. Um, so on to our final speaker today, uh, who is Bala Niku, who is an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education and Social Work at Thompson Rivers University. I think you might be still muted. Okay, is that okay? Is this working now? Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your slides. Yeah, thank you. Um, being on the last speaker on this panel, I am, I'm feeling the pressure for, for maintaining this time, but thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to, uh, to share my uh, uh, this little project that funded by Michael Smith uh, in, in July 2020. Basically, it's been two months that we've been working on this idea. What we want to do uh, together, my colleagues from UBC and um, the Thompson uh, Vision Family Division of Practice and a colleague from uh, Computer Science TRU, we are trying to identify the mapping social epidemiology of BC. Me being a, a racialized scholar myself, Coming from Asia, uh, I feel you know there there is a racialization of pandemic. There's a there's a racial uh, microaggression, and um, I don't need to highlight what's happening with the race and the pandemic. You know the way it is evolving uh, in BC, in Canada, and beyond Canada. So we want to find out uh, how the frontline health workers, being the cornerstone of the whole health system, are surviving and flourishing and thriving, and at the same time doing their job. So. Uh, myself, um, uh, an assistant professor at uh, School of Social Work, uh, ha having the idea of um, working in the uh, uh, disasters in 2015 and 2018 back in Asia, uh, being frontline workers, it's it's very difficult. You know, you 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 are part of the you yourself is a victim. At the same time, you have to serve others. So I, I really acknowledge uh, where TRU is located on on this big uh, um, nations where. I live and work with my family now as an immigrant, and I've gone through this COVID myself, and, and I think this is going to be very important for my uh, for this research, bring, bringing that experiential learning uh, for this for this research project. I work with uh, Mohammed Taiwid, uh, TRU, uh, Mohammed Ibrahim from UBC, Dr. Graham uh, from Thompson Region Divisional Family Practice, and Ms. Rhonda Eden, again from Thompson Region Divisional Fam uh, Family Practice. Without this help, uh, this project would have not been taken place. So I really acknowledge uh, my colleagues at uh, TRU and my funders and the partners who are very important in this research. Basically, the aim of this research is basically, I already mentioned how it looks like being a health worker, a frontline health worker in a pandemic myself, you know, uh, being a social work. Uh, the, some jobs are more dangerous than others, and there are sig significant psychological distress that the health workers have been experiencing uh, right from the COVID. And this is not the first time that health workers are experiencing this distress, anxiety, or burnout. But uh, we have a history and published you know, um, 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 uh, literature that uh, health workers have been attacked. Uh, they've been um, uh, under um, uh, a disadvantage, especially health workers coming from Asia or and minority racial, uh, being women. I think they're not paid well. Uh, there is a whole uh, inequity and injustice uh, uh, been published, as you can see, some of those uh, statements here. Um, so, so some of my indigenous colleagues have been preparing uh, masks for the for the elders and fellow workers, 
And another uh, colleague uh, mentioned that um, his partner is a nurse and uh, she had a difficult time at the workspace, which is also impacting the home environment and the children uh, not being able to uh, take in care or provide you know, care facilities. So the, I don't need to really convince anybody here how uh, the life of a frontline health worker in a pandemic like COVID-19. We have enough evidence of the burnout, anxiety, depression, even, even, uh, even uh, verbal abuse, micro racism, uh, uh, the whole lot of uh, health inequities being faced by health workers, and thanks to COVID uh, nineteen, which actually brought this, you know, to the to the to the discussion. As you can see, there's a lot of discussions happening. How some of the health workers are not being included in the policy. Again, what I'm saying here is uh, the way the politics of policy or the politics of pandemic management is also affecting uh, the, the the lives and well-being and occupational resilience of uh, frontline workers. So this is what motivated us to study what's happening in BC. Uh, we really want to kind of understand how, how to determine the, the job level satisfaction when frontline workers are uh, continuously under, under uh, anxiety or, uh, or they're not able to do well because their families have not been taken care. So we want to determine the, the job satisfaction. They, we want to determine the burnout levels. We want, we want to really uh, find out the preparedness of frontline health workers not only during the COVID pandemic, but also in future pandemics. So we really want to understand their occupational well-being. That is one of the aims of our research project. Uh, not only that, we also want to build on uh, the information that we will be able to find out from this uh, psychological you know, analysis or psychological um, uh, uh, scales that we will be using here. We want to build on uh, the descriptive and predictive models. This is where I'm excited as a social worker using uh, computer uh, computing social sciences, which is a new uh, area for me. So how do we build these descriptive and predictive models and why do we need to build these models? Because being uh, uh, psychology, um, uh, um, being a sensitive, uh, I mean, like frontline workers uh, are, are, um, are, um, are going through a, a, a lot more uh, uh, a life world, I would say, you know, both at family and the workplace and the community and being racialized and Asian, you know, uh, so they, 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 they're facing uh, multiple vulnerabilities. And how do we really understand all that through questionnaires, which again adds to their, their vulnerability. So by using uh, these predictive models, maybe we will be able to find out how in future our frontline workers will be responding to and what is that we need to do so that, you know, so their occupational resiliency and well-being can be taken care. This is where I come back to the, the computing social sciences, you know, and where uh, Professor Tavid will be helping us. And at the same time, we also want to recommend our policy uh, strategies so that they're evidence-based and they're tested so that we can still, you know, save some lives. Also, you know, the, the occupational resilience of the frontline workers. So we, we want to determine the job level satisfactions. We want to build some models. We want to recommend this is what the tra knowledge translation, uh, the piece comes in. Um, uh, how do we do this? We have these three main questions to answer these uh, 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 research objectives. How prepared are our health workers now and in the future? Uh, uh, what are the health uh, equity measures are in place, especially uh, we know that you know about 10,000 uh, frontline health workers that are involved in uh, about 40,000 uh, um, uh, um, people who are in the, in, the, in the home care. There are another 30,000 uh, health workers that are involved in uh, long-term care and many other facilities. So it's a huge number. So how equity measures are in place in, in some, many of these institutions, uh, especially unionized, un uh, uh, unorganized, organized. So I'm trying to understand the whole, uh, not from a, uh, coming from a health background, but I see that the whole sector is unequally um, uh, um, uh, uh, functioning as of now. So how can we really understand health equity measures and put them in place so that, you know, we can contribute to the system resiliency here. Uh, our social networks, this is where I think we want to come back to understand uh, we are all part of these social networks and our work is being influenced by the social networks that we are part of because culture, uh, um, the way we live, the socialization, the way we understand the world, uh, the way we uh, are loyal to our, our, our the bring trust to our, our workspace. Uh, there's so many other you know, social determinants of health you know, impacts um, uh, the way we work and deliver you know, the quality of care. So we also want to understand what kind of social networks does exist uh, when it comes to frontline worker, workers and how and whether these social networks are influencing the decisions that the frontline health workers make. 
So basically, it's a, it's a mixed methodology, as you can see. We want to use psychological scales, for example, IES R22 item scale, which, which tells us what kind of traumatic events that the frontline health workers have gone through and what kind of subject to distress that they have caused. And we also want to see the, the, the burnout levels. So we can, we can actually capture this. But once we know what's happening to our frontline health workers, we can already give some suggestions there so that you know, our, our policymakers can start doing something at the, at the workplace. But we don't want to stop there. We also want to kind of reach out some of those uh, health workers who are interested in uh, uh, providing a more in-depth uh, qualitative interviews, which is grounded in narrative inquiry, the narrative stories, which is also very therapeutic in that sense. And I've been trained in and, and, and grounded theory. So we will reach out um, some of those uh, health workers who would like to give us a more in-depth uh, uh, resiliency or how do they function, uh, what kind of family background they come from, how are they managing both professional and personal lives, what kind of you know networks they're part of. So with this, we will be able to answer the first question, you know, how our frontline health workers are able to do well. But we also want to do uh, some social network analysis because this is where we can actually uh, model and also, you know, kind of uh, predict, you know, how uh, in case of second wave, third wave of, of this pandemic or future pandemics, what is that we need to do to, to make this frontline health workers more resilient? And this is where we will be using uh, one of those softwares, maybe PESA, where we can find out uh, the, the type of networks, whether it is egocentric network or is it a socio-centric network, what kind of motives, you know, who are these decision makers and how decisions are being made, uh, the kind of choices that frontline workers make, whether networks has any, any, any role to play. And we come back finally to agent-based modeling. I think this is fantastic again, because we're all agents, you know, in this, in this larger, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, pandemic, you know, paradigm. And, and we should be able to uh, model individual agents because our individual behaviors are finally influencing the, 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 the pandemic behavior or infodemic or whatever in our earlier speakers spoke about. So we should be able to build uh, models by controlling race or age or unionized, unorganized or geography and give some models to our frontline you know, the, uh, uh, unions uh, already, um, uh, I think, uh, doing a lot of work for these, these frontline workers. So with uh, mixed methodology, we should be able to answer how, the, how frontline workers are able to function now, how they will be able to function in future, what is that health system should be uh, in place to make these things happen. So there are methodological challenges when we make uh, these models. I think they have to be robust and, and dependent on, on the data that we have. They have to be transparent. Anybody should be able to use my data and make their own models. We should be able to give access and rigor. So this is one methodological challenges being a social work, nursing, and, and um, interdisciplinary people coming together and building these models. There are methodological models, I mean, uh, issues here. We will be able to find, uh, solve these, uh, these methodological issues with the help of our advisory committee, uh, which is composed of um, uh, interdisciplinary researchers and also uh, frontline health workers. We are also thinking, how do we really translate uh, you know, the, the kind of findings that makes really a, a difference to frontline health workers in the first place and their families and, and, and the wider society. So some of these challenges can be uh, addressed by developing collaborative partnerships, which is my presentation itself is part of reaching out all of you. We made some beautiful connections with the hospital employees union, BC nursing union and health authorities. Um, uh, some colleagues are very much interested. As, as I mentioned, it's just been two months that we've been funded this project. We are going through the, the UBC RISE system to get a, a harmonized you know, research ethics clearance so that we can reach out colleagues across the province. So I'm very confident that we will be able to find answers and help our frontline health workers to build their own resiliency and their family functioning and the networks that we build are robust and resilient so that we can build a healthy a resilient a bc uh, and and face future pandemics uh, uh, that's what the power of social work and interdisciplinary work that we've been doing and i want to thank each one of you for staying online uh, even at this point of time thank you so much Thanks very much, Bella, and um, apologies for letting the session run long, but I hope you'll all agree that we had some um, fantastic and informative speakers today. Um, the chat had some great conversation going, so I'd ask all of the speakers to take a look there for questions. They will remain up during the, the, the breakouts. Um, also, the three breakout rooms um, have been posted in the chat, so I uh, hope to see you all in your next session. Thanks very much. Thank you.